everyone. In this video, we're gonna focus on glomerular filtration and Bowman's capsules. So we're just gonna draw a blow up of all the structures that we've drawn before and that way we can take a closer look at them. So we know that entering into Bowman's capsule, we have the afferent arteriole. And notice that in this drawing, the afferent arteriole is noticeably wider than the efferent arteriole. We also know that the capillary structure that actually sits sort of in Bowman's capsule is called the glomerulus, and it's an example of a fenestrated capillary, meaning that there are pores in the capillary on purpose. And then of course we have the efferent arteriole that exits Bowman's capsule and will continue on to become the peritubular capillary. Now the glomerulus is surrounded by some epithelial cells and of course anytime that we have epithelial cells we also have a basement membrane. So the basement membrane is really nothing more than a thin layer of non-cellular material that's been secreted by the epithelial cells that are connected to it. And the basement membrane noticeably has a negative charge. And this is actually going to be important when we discuss filtering. And then the epithelial cells that are connected to the basement membrane are called podocytes. And they make up the visceral layer uh, remember before we said Bowman's capsule has a visceral layer and a parietal layer and similar to all the other occurrences where we describe serous membranes, we know that when there is visceral and parietal, there's a layer of fluid in between them. So the podocytes are located most closely to the glomerulus and then there's a layer of simple squamous epithelium that makes up the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. Now let's just describe for a moment the blood flow through the afferent arteriole. We know that filtration is going to occur at Bowman's capsule and we know that Bowman's capsule sort of functions as a funnel, but initially we just want to describe how the fluid moves into Bowman's capsule in the first place. So the, the blood is going to be traveling through the afferent arteriole and then it will pass through the glomerulus where there are some holes or fenestrations and then as we reach the efferent arteriole, we notice that the efferent arteriole is strikingly narrow. And so whenever you have blood that's trying to flow from a wide vessel into a more narrow vessel, you can imagine that there's going to be some backing up of the blood. So very similar to when you have two lanes of traffic that suddenly need to become one, we notice that at that point where there's going to be this merging, there is a slowing of the moving of the vehicles. And so because the blood flow is going to be slow leaving the efferent arteriole, we get some backing up of the blood into the glomerulus. Already we know that plasma, or just water even, will move out of a vessel, particularly a capillary, because of high hydrostatic pressure, higher hydrostatic pressure than osmotic pressure. So you could think of the hydrostatic pressure as the force that pushes the blood out of the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule. And then of course there is some fluid in Bowman's capsule, but and, and that would make up the osmotic pressure, but the hydrostatic pressure is going to definitely be higher and we make sure of that by narrowing the efferent arteriole and backing up the blood into the glomerulus. So we have easy movement of water and other stuff out of the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule. So we actually can describe this movement in terms of the glomerular filtration rate, which is abbreviated GFR. And the GFR is the amount of filtrate that's produced by the kidneys each minute. So uh, both kidneys combined, it's about 125 mLs per minute that's filtered. And 99% is going to be reabsorbed. So we, we mentioned before that if we didn't reabsorb the water that was filtered, we would become immensely dehydrated, it would not take very long. So 99% is gonna be reabsorbed. Now that we've described the movement of water and maintenance of the rate of filtering, I just wanna also describe the movement of the other particles into Bowman's capsule. So as we described previously, anything that is small enough to fit through the fenestrations or the pores of the glomerulus, those molecules will be able to just move easily. So if the water moves, then ions and glucose molecules and amino acids, those things are just gonna move right as well. And even the waste products, which um, the, the fenestrations are large enough, particularly so that the waste products could fit through. So those waste products are gonna travel through the fenestrations as well. But what we wanna discuss is the stuff that doesn't move, the things that are too big to fit through the holes. 
um, or the things that, you know, maybe they could fit through the holes if they really squeeze, but we really want to make sure that they don't pass. So we know, for example, that proteins are negatively charged. And we mentioned before the basement membrane has a lot of negative charge. Really what it comes down to is among the non-cellular materials that are secreted, there are some negatively charged proteins that are hanging out in the basement membrane. And so because negative charge repels negative charge, the proteins that are negatively charged, even if they could squeeze through those fenestrations, they really can't because the negative charge is gonna push them away. And then, we do have one final layer of protection, which is something called filtration slits. And the podocytes are responsible for the filtration slits. So the filtration slits, although the drawing is maybe not quite going to depict this, the filtration slits offer one final layer of protection in that if something that we want to save in the blood is able to squeeze through the glomerulus and it doesn't, it's not repelled by the negative charge of the basement membrane, they still have to make it through these additional slits um, or the spaces in between the podocytes in order to actually enter into Bowman's capsule. Although we are purposefully employing the use of fenestrations and slits to help things move easily into Bowman's capsule so that we don't have to utilize any energy, the arrangement or the layout of the cells and the cell structures allows for some noticeable control over the things that are able and not able to move. So we can really focus on the stuff that moves, which is the water, the ions, the glucose, the amino acids, nutrients, and things that we want to save, as well as the waste products that we purposefully want to eliminate, but there are certain things like proteins, red blood cells, and other things that are in the plasma that won't be able to make it through. Everything that is able to pass, of course, into Bowman's capsule is next going to move into the proximal convoluted tubule. And beginning in the proximal convoluted tubule, we can focus on the two processes of reabsorption and secretion. And we'll describe the proximal convoluted tubule in the next video. Now, one of the most important things about filtering and the events that occur at Bowman's capsule is the maintenance of homeostasis, and in particular, regulation of the fluid composition and volume of the blood. And so this is kind of a multifaceted discussion, but I just want to start out by pointing out the cells of the juxtaglomerular complex. We mentioned that there were three types, and in this case, we want to describe the granular cells. And granular cells are the cells of the afferent arterial. In particular, they are enlarged smooth muscle cells, and these smooth muscle cells contain secretory granules that have renin inside of them. So renin is an enzyme and it's stored just in these little packets. And then whenever there needs to be release of, of renin, we'll just have exocytosis um, and the renin can be released into the, into the afferent arteriole. The granular cells also act as baroreceptors to monitor the blood pressure of the afferent arteriole. So they can recognize adequate stretch or inadequate stretch as the blood is flowing into the afferent arteriole and can contract or relax accordingly. So in terms of regulation of the glomerular filtration rate, we can describe three types of regulation. Local regulation, which is also called autoregulation, neural regulation, so neural innervation of the structures, and hormonal regulation, or release of hormones in order to maintain GFR. So let's begin by describing local regulation or autoregulation. Local regulation is responsible for making adjustments in the diameter of the afferent and efferent arterioles in response to minor changes in blood pressure. So we'll just divide the, the possibilities in half. Um, obviously, we can have an either a decrease or an increase. So if we have a minor decrease in blood pressure, then what we'll get is decreased stretch. The, the granular cells will recognize decreased stretch at the afferent arteriole and so they will actually widen or dilate the afferent arteriole. And similarly, they will constrict the efferent arteriole. And so by dilating the afferent arteriole and constricting the efferent arteriole, essentially what we're doing is increasing the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus, which means that we can maintain GFR. Opposite, if we have a minor increase in blood pressure. We can uh, recognize an increase in stretch and as a result of that increase in stretch activate the, gr the granular cells and will actually generate uh, smooth muscle contraction and then we will have constriction 
of the afferent arteriole. Now, true enough, we can have dilation of the efferent as well, but it doesn't really matter because as long as we're constricting the afferent, we're reducing the amount of blood that can enter. And so if we reduce the amount of blood that even makes it to the glomerulus or slow the rate of entry, then we are by default decreasing the hydrostatic pressure. Now, it's not going to be enough for the osmotic pressure to then be higher and move stuff back in. We just want to sort of slow the rate of, of, of glomerular filtration. So local regulation is all about keeping the GFR constant. So we're assuming in this situation that there's no major malfunction in the body. We wanna make sure the kidneys filter. In terms of the hierarchy, we know that it's important to have perfusion and continual function of things like the brain, the heart, and the lungs, and the kidneys are number four on that list. They absolutely are, are in need of constant supply of blood, and we need to have constant maintenance of the GFR. And if we don't, then we're likely to develop an, a homeostatic imbalance in, in, in any number of complications that could ensue. Now, neural regulation doesn't really step in until there's something more extreme happening. So let's take the example of hypovolemia. Hypovolemia can lead to hypotension and the recognition of hypotension will lead to sympathetic activation. Sympathetic activation causes vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole. So the reason that we would need to constrict the afferent arteriole is not to maintain the GFR, but rather to say, I'm sorry kidneys, but right now the blood is needed elsewhere. So if there is vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole, this is very bad for the kidneys, but the body has ranked the, the brain, the heart, and the lungs above the kidneys, and it's simply saying that at that point in time, the, the blood is needed for those organs. So sympathetic activation that is bad enough that causes vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole, that will lead to a decrease in GFR. So it's bad for the kidneys, but it's happening because it needs to preserve the body. Typically, if we have a map of 60, we're perfusing the kidneys, but anything lower than a map of 60, we need to worry about vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole. So the patient has to be really hypotensive. It has to be really, really bad. But just know that when we are in this particular state, the kidneys can suffer and they can't really survive that long without, without good blood flow. And the last option is, is hormonal regulation. And hormonal regulation, I just wanna draw the pathway quickly here. So angiotensinogen is uh, an inactive hormone that needs to be chopped up a little bit in order to become active. Angiotensinogen is produced in the liver by the hepatocytes and renin, which is secreted by the granular cells of the afferent arteriole, um, is the enzyme that will convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. So angiotensinogen may be clearly circulating and with plenty of availability, but until there is activation, so until there's recognition of a decrease in blood flow at the afferent arteriole, there is no particular need to secrete renin, and so there's no particular need to convert the angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. But as soon as we have a problem, the renin will be released, so the angiotensinogen is, is converted to angiotensin 1. And then ACE, which is angiotensin converting enzyme, which is produced in the lungs, in particular the alveolar type 2 cells, will convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And this should be familiar because there are lots of patients who take ACE inhibitors. And so if you take an ACE inhibitor, then essentially you don't want to produce angiotensin 2 because of the effects of angiotensin 2. So there are let's so let's just take a look at the effects. There are four very important effects of angiotensin 2. And what we'll see is sort of a, a recognition of a, a, a previous pattern that we described in which hormones potentiate or control other hormones. So angiotensin 2, effect number one is peripheral vasoconstriction. So in times of hypotension, angiotensin 1 can cause peripheral vasoconstriction, which can increase the blood pressure. Number two is constriction of the efferent arteriole. So constriction of the efferent arteriole is purposeful with the objective of maintaining the GFR. So if we're not getting enough blood flow into the afferent arteriole, but we constrict the efferent arteriole, we can have a little bit of hope of improving the GFR. Number three is release of antidiuretic hormone or ADH. And we'll describe the specific mechanism of ADH in the, the video for the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. 
but ADH is responsible for water reabsorption. So if the blood pressure is low or the blood volume is low and we increase water reabsorption in the kidneys, we can actually improve blood pressure and blood volume. And number four is release of aldosterone. Release of aldosterone also will be described in terms of its mechanism in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct video, but it's responsible for increasing sodium reabsorption. And we know that water follows solute, and so if there is reabsorption of salt, there will be also reabsorption of water, which means that we will improve and maintain blood pressure and blood volume. So these four, these four events are critical in terms of maintaining blood pressure and blood volume. And when we get to a point where we're sort of facing the opposite, so we either have plenty of, uh, of blood volume or the blood pressure is high, and maybe we even need to decrease it a little, we can actually release atrial natriuretic peptide or ANP. And ANP opposes this renin angiotensin system. So what we'll get with release of ANP, which is from the um, contracting cells of the atria, is inhibition of renin secretion, inhibition of ADH secretion, and, and inhibition of aldosterone secretion. So essentially opposing all of the effects of angiotensin II and opposing the, the, the preparation of angiotensin II, we can actually decrease blood pressure and blood volume as needed. So between these three types of regulation, local, neural, and hormonal, we actually can have a very tight rein on what the, not only what the blood volume and blood pressure is of the body, but also how the GFR is maintained or functioning on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, so that concludes the events that occur at Bowman's capsule. And as we described, from Bowman's capsule, the filtrate will move into the renal tubule, particularly the proximal convoluted tubule, and we'll describe those events next. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.